How's everybody doing? Good. Thank you. So my name is Kafia Hailey, and I want to thank you all for having me here. Um, so I'm going to give you my background just a little bit. Um, so I'm from Atlanta. I went to undergrad at Spelman College uh, a long time ago. And this is actually my second time at Georgia Tech. Y'all have a beautiful campus. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so my parents, uh, just so we can connect this to Black and Palestinian solidarity. My parents are from Chicago. And my mom actually got my dad uh, connected with the Black Panther Party in Chicago. So he was a member of the Black Panthers. And when he was in the Black Panthers, he was actually trained by Palestinians. So that's our family's connection to Palestine. Um, my brother is a state representative here who called for a ceasefire um, and like advocates for Palestine. For years, I wanted to know more about Palestine and I didn't know a whole lot until things started coming up on social media. And the thing that changed for me was in 2020, seeing so many black folks getting hurt by police. And I remember what it was like when people actually spoke up for us. So in 2021, I saw what was happening in East Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah in Palestine. And I was like, I have to say something because I remember what it was like, how lonely it felt when people didn't speak up for us. And then I started learning more, like reaching out to Palestinian activists because I wanted to learn more. I went to grad school at Tufts University. I studied international relations and I actually focused on the Middle East. And I graduated from that school with them never saying the word Palestine. So I left not even knowing if I was allowed to say that word or if Palestine was considered a bad word. But look at how much things have changed where we can say that openly now. But as I started to learn more, I, I wanted to just keep learning. So last year I went to Palestine and I asked, what is it that you all want me to do with all the information that I'm learning here? Because I don't believe in speaking over Palestinians, just like we don't want white people talking to us about what it means to be black. And they said, tell people what you saw here, what you learned and how to hold your political officials accountable. So all of this is about learning what actual solidarity is and what we can do because we're actually united in this. So can you all still hear me? Okay, so what I wanna do is before I get into this, I'm gonna start with this poem. How many of you all have heard the poem, Enemy of the Sun? Wonderful. As I'm reading just part of it, I want you to tell me if a black person wrote it in this country or a Palestinian. Okay. You may take the last strip of my land, feed my youth to prison cells. You may plunder my heritage. You may burn my books, my poems, or feed my flesh to the dogs. You may spread a web of terror on the roofs of my village, O enemy of the sun, but I shall not compromise, and to the last pulse in my veins I shall resist. You may put out the light in my eyes. You may deprive me of my mother's kisses. You may curse my father, my people. You may distort my history. You may deprive my children of a smile and of life's necessities. You may fool my friends with a borrowed face. You may build walls of hatred around me. You may glue my eyes to humiliations, O enemy of the sun, but I shall not compromise. And to the last pulse in my veins, I shall resist. How many of you think a black person wrote that in this country? It's treat it like there's no right or wrong. I'm gonna tell you at the end. But how many of you think a black person could have written that? Okay, who wants to tell me why you thought a black person might have written that? Anyway, there's like literally no wrong answer. Like I'm not your teacher, so I can't grade you. I can't, I can't give y'all, y'all get A's for the day. Okay, what makes you think a, a black person might've written it? Yep. Good. Anyone else who thought it might be a black person who wrote it? Who wants to share why? Okay. Who thinks a Palestinian wrote it? Okay. So this poem was actually found in the prison. Oh, who wants to tell me why they thought a Palestinian wrote it? There's no right or wrong answers. There, I mean, there is, but. Something about the like burn, burn our books piece kind of stuck out to me. Uh -huh. I know that's a thing. Yeah. But did it sound like it, it could have possibly been both, right? So this poem called Enemy of the Sun was found in George Jackson's prison cell after he was murdered by police. Um, he was a member of the Black Panther Party in California. And it was found in his prison cell, written in his handwriting. And it was published in the Black Panther newspaper because everyone thought he wrote it. But actually, it was originally written by Sami al-Qasim, who was a Palestinian poet. 
And in the 1960s, around 1967, Palestinians were trying to get their poetry published in this country so that we could all understand what was happening to them. And no publishing company would publish their work except Drum and Spear, which was a publishing company started by members of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a Black student civil rights group. So Samuel Qasem got his work published by this Black publishing company. And then his work was featured in a newspaper that George Jackson read in prison and just wrote it out by hand as he's passing time in prison. And everyone saw it written in his, his handwriting and thought he wrote it because it sounds like what Black people go through, but it's also what Palestinians go through. This is the foundation of solidarity. So much of what happens to Palestinians actually happened to our ancestors or is coming for us now. That's where that connection lies. So now we're gonna dig deeper into that. But when you read that poem, like you're gonna feel it. When you know that history now, you're gonna feel it differently. Um, as I'm going through this, I want y'all to ask questions, okay? Like this, we'll do a little bit of like our lecture, but at any time you can ask questions. Uh, I always like to start with this picture because when we hear what's going on in Palestine, like think about the movies that you see and the images that you see, we always see destruction. And it's, it's important to know what's happening, but it's also very easy if we see destruction to assume that that's what it's supposed to be like, that that's just the way things are over there. That's what we're supposed to believe, but that's not the case. So I'll start with this picture. This was taken by Motaz Azeza in Gaza. And so the point is for us to remember that there is still life there. And that's what we're all fighting for is to preserve life. So we're gonna connect this again, like I'm gonna do a little bit of history and then we're gonna get into like what's really going on now. Um, the reason we do this is, how many of you all have heard that phrase, it's complicated? Isn't it strange that we've all heard the same phrase? It's almost like somebody put that phrase out there for us to all repeat. Why do you think we've all heard that phrase? What are we supposed to do when we hear that phrase? Like if I say, I want you all to learn about Palestine and you say, it's complicated, what's, what's the point of that? Yep. Exactly, it's too hard to understand it, so I'm just not gonna be bothered with it. That's it. And whenever we hear history, there are certain people that will tell us, we have to remember that this started October 7th. Think about if we're talking about black history and we started at, not George Floyd getting killed, we start the day after and there's riots. And we only talk about black history from the point of riots in 2020 forward. What's wrong with that? Yes. There we go. Uh -huh. And it also makes black people look like the aggressors in a situation where they're retaliating. Mm -hmm. And then it justifies whatever's done to us, right? Same thing. So when we talk about Palestine, we don't start at October 7th. That's not when Palestine began. So we're going to start further back and talk about the fact that Palestinians are indigenous to Palestine. The reason we got to talk about that is because just the fact that you are sitting in this room right now means there are going to be people that try to convince you to think otherwise. They're going to try and tell you that it's their homeland. So that's why we got to start with history so that when you all go and talk about Palestine, everybody can speak about it accurately. This is what you're doing right now just by being in this room is, is more powerful than you all understand. We're gonna explain why at the end. So first understand that Palestinians are indigenous to Palestine. Is there anyone that did not know that? There's no shame in this classroom because we have not been taught this stuff before. When, when I say indigenous, it means like Native Americans are indigenous to this country. Is there anyone that didn't know that before? I'm glad that's the whole point of us being here. So there's no shame in that. So for 400 years, Palestine was under control of the Ottoman Empire, modern day Turkey, 400 years. Is that number significant for black folks? What's the significance of 400 for black people? Slavery, 400 years were under the control of other people as well. So after that, when you get to World War I, as World War I starting, the British reach out to the Arab tribes. So not just Palestine, but the, the entire region where there are Arabs and they say, we need support in fighting. And they ask for Arab support and the Arab tribal leader says, yes, we will fight alongside of you as long as you give us our independence. That's it. Independence. It's not because we love the British. They want freedom. So remember, when you're agreeing to fight alongside people in a war, it means that you're willing to put your life at risk. You're saying, I'm willing to be away from my family and risk my life for the goal of freedom. And so that's what the Arab tribes agreed to do. But what the British did instead was they went behind their backs. And in 1916, the British and the French sat down with a map of the region and start carving out which areas they want for themselves. So the British carve out an area and they go, we want Palestine, we want Jordan, we want Iraq. The French say we want Lebanon, we want Syria. That's what they do. So they're already betraying Palestinians. 
The reason I'm telling you this is I was taught these facts in school, but it was taught in completely the wrong way, um, about, like an all lives matter type way, basically. So that's, they're betrayed in 1916. 1917 in the UK, Balfour, Lord Balfour, who's the foreign secretary, decides that Palestine will become the national homeland of Jewish people. Let me ask you, are there Jewish people in Palestine? There are, are there Jewish Palestinians? Does anybody know a Jewish Palestinian or know a name of one? Y'all ever heard of Jesus? <laughs> it's a Jewish Palestinian. That's it. So when people, that, that's the Jewish Palestinian, right? <laughs> the reason you need to know that is because how many times have you all heard Arabs in, or Palestinians and Jews? As if Palestinians can't be Jewish. As if that's not where those of us who are Christian are, where our faith actually came from, is from a Palestinian Jew. So there are Jewish Palestinians, Christian Palestinians, Muslim Palestinians. But Lord Balfour says that Palestine will become the homeland for Jewish people. What he means is Jewish people in Europe, because he doesn't want them there. So he's basically telling them to get out, and this will be your homeland. So what if I decide that your house is now the national homeland of my, my family, and I got some hood relatives, and they're going to come to your house? Is that okay with you all? That's, that's my new home. What would you all say if I said, oh, hey, Lydia, <laughs> like, if that's my new home, what would you all say? Right, because well, what's going to happen to you? I'm going to kick you out. That's it. And who am I to just decide that that's, that's my new home for my family? That's what happened. Their home was declared a new homeland for Jewish people. Huh? This is a, a, also, she's, she's maybe the second most famous Palestinian Christian. <laughs> This is Lydia. <laughs> Lydia's a Georgia Tech alum too. Hey, Lydia. <laughs> so that's happening. So they're already betrayed once by the British here, then again. And then, so what happens from 19 to 60? So keep in mind that they're fighting for their freedom, trying to get out of the control of the Ottoman Empire. They've been risking their lives, and now people are playing games with them, making all these deals behind their backs. So they revolt, like any of us would if somebody's like, you risked your lives for us, and we're taking your homeland. So from 1916 to 1918, there's an Arab revolt against the British. The British respond by killing Palestinians, arresting them, torturing them. And another connection, um, so when Palestinians were held in prison by the British, sisters would come through, like Palestinian sisters, and they would sing a song about how to escape. And they would put like the letter L in front of different words in Arabic because they knew the British wouldn't be able to understand what that is. And they would sing a song about how to escape. Does that sound like anything in, in our culture? What does it sound like? Yeah. Exactly, it's how we would sing songs too about how to escape. You all see the connections between us already? People going through oppression. So 1916 and 1918, there's an Arab revolt, but you've got this man, Balfour, who's telling European Jews that they can come over. They're, they're being mistreated in their country. And he's saying, you all can go over to Palestine. But as they're coming over, they form militias. Irgun Haganah. When I say militia, you all remember what happened January 6th at the Capitol? Those are militias. People who are not soldiers, who are not police officers, they just get weapons and they can kill people. And the British start training them to kill and they start killing Palestinians. They help, and they help destroy the Arab revolt. So now we're gonna move up to, so that's basically what's happening on this map. What I want you to do is first just look at this land. If you don't know any of the history, Look at this map. You all know how to play games, right? You all know how to play board games or games on the computer. Imagine there's a green team and there's a white team. What does it look like the goal of the game is? What is the white team trying to do? What is it doing? It's trying to change all the tiles white. It's trying to get all the pieces that are green and it's almost successful. If you know that, if you can just glance at this map and get that, that's the whole goal is Israel's trying to get every piece that's Palestine and take all of it. That's what we're watching happen right now. Not anything about hostages. You're watching them trying to get every piece of land. That's it. So this is where we started. We talked about the Ottoman Empire. All this land is green. Where you see the white, those are colonies. So when you hear us talk about colonizers, that's not something we made up to be offensive. They actually referred to themselves as colonizers. There was a Jewish colonization association and they actually put ads in the paper that said, come colonize Palestine. Colonizers, okay? Right? <laughs> right, you wonder like who would be that bold, right? But, but that's how it is. So now we get to here. So after we talked about Balfour Declaration, all that, what we're moving to now is right after World War II, there's a greater influx of, of European Jewish refugees coming into Palestine. Those militias still exist. The Ergun and the Haggadah still exist. 
And what the United Nations does is they say, we're going to split Palestine in half, and we're going to make half of it become a new country called Israel. So who's got a house? Who, who has a nice place where they stay? OK, so we're going to go to your house, and we're going to split it in half. That's, that's OK with you, right? She's not. I just made her a deal, and she didn't take it. How stu That's stubborn, right? Have you all ever heard Zionist people who support Israel say that? So this is what, and I couldn't figure out what they meant. They will say, we gave the Arabs a deal and they didn't take it. That's what they mean. This was the deal. I take half of your land, put up with it. That's all that means. So why would they say that? Why would they, like I just called her stubborn. Why would they try and say, we offered them a deal and they didn't take it? Right? And what does it make the other person look like? Can you all relate to that? Can the black folks relate to this? We're so aggressive, right? You're so angry. I tried to be nice to you, but you're so angry. You didn't let me just call you the N word. Why? Right? That's what this is. So this is the partitioning. This is the deal that was given. And it's splitting the country in half. So first off, who is the United Nations to tell them they're going to split the country in half? Right? You see, I haven't talked about religion a whole lot. When I talked about Ottoman Empire and sykes picot I didn't talk about religion because this is not a religious conflict and it never was. This is a story of a people who have never gotten to have a say in what happens to them or their land. That's it. That's all it is. So you see that it's split in half. They had no business telling the Palestinians they were going to split their country in half. But look at how they split it. Not across, not down the middle. It's like if somebody says, we're splitting the US in half and there's going to be California and Florida. And you got family in California, you got family in Florida. How are you going to get to them now? And that's the point. The point is to divide them, to weaken them. So this is what, what happened after the UN split the country in half. Then those militias that still existed, the Ergun and the Haganah, they said, we want to speed up this process of the creation of Israel. So they started just going through Palestine, killing Palestinians, driving them off their land. Yes. So there was a combination of things. So there was, after World War II, there were Jewish people like were mistreated in Europe. So they wanted a place to go as refugees. We can understand like things are dangerous, you want to get out of your country, but then to be like, oh no, but this is my land now. Yeah, this was a justification. When you go today, what you'll see is there are a lot of people who are not even, who don't believe in God, who are Israelis, who are Jewish, who don't believe in God, um, who are not very religious but we'll still quote the Torah and be like, oh, it says here that this is my land, God said it. And it's like, but you don't even believe in God. What does this sound? Oh, someone said this sounds familiar. What does it sound like? Manifest destiny, white supremacy, what'd you say? Oh. Well, I can't say anything about politics today. I'm not allowed to, because I'd have lots to say about lots of people. Okay. All right, so getting back to this. So what they did is these militias would go through. And so maybe there's a family down here who's, in, who's Palestinian. They would maybe have to flee here, flee to another area. They become refugees because of that. So this area, Haifa, is along the coast. Colonizers love them some beaches, don't they? Y'all know that. OK, right, we know. <laughs> so this area of Haifa, there's nowhere to go. The militias came at them from three different angles. There was no place to go but into the water, where there were boats waiting. If they were lucky, the Palestinians could get into boats, but a lot of them drowned because there were too many people trying to get in the boats. But if they got into those boats, they were able to get away to places like Syria, Jordan, US. The point is, they can't go back home now. Israel won't let them move back into their houses. And some of them, like these Israelis, live in their houses now. So a lot of Palestinians will have the key to their home that an Israeli is living in right now. So if you meet somebody who is Palestinian-American, they're Palestinian. Don't think of it as like, oh, they're an Italian-American and they came here for a better way of life. They would be at home if they could. And I used to hear Palestinians say that, and I understood it kind of. And then I went there, and you see how beautiful it is, and you understand, oh, you would be there if you could. It's not just like something that's a story that's told. It's beautiful, y'all. It really is. OK, so then what happens? And the way that they killed um, Palestinians and drove them off the land, who knows about the Tulsa massacre or Rosewood massacre? Who can tell us about it? Oh, tell me. It's a whole lot of stories like that. Yeah. Well, you're like, yes, go work. 
multi-day race riot in which this entire city was set on. So Tulsa was like a, a really affluent black city in the making, like along the Black Wall Street lines. And so, yeah, it was lit on fire and like, how many, so how many of y'all, uh, especially for Black folks, how many of y'all have had family members that had to leave the South because it was dangerous or they were accused of killing a, a white person? Or somebody in your family who's had, had that happen? Ask your families, a lot of us have. I have family on both sides that had to flee the South because of racism, because they were accused of fighting back. Um, we had, I have two different, I have a last name and my family has a different last name, different spellings. In Arkansas, our family lived there and there were white people that put a notice in the newspaper that said, leave this land by 12 o'clock on this date or you will be killed. Y'all have stories like that in your families, you just gotta ask. Same thing, Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she just said it was an affluent community. There were the neighboring white community, didn't have as much money. They wound up bombing it, like literally flying planes over the community and killing black folks and the black folks had to escape. Same thing happened in Rosewood. They accused a black man of assaulting a white woman as an excuse because the Rosewood community that was black had money and they came through and killed the black people there and black people had to flee. There's so many stories. Y'all just gotta ask your family members, but there's tons of stories of black folks who had to leave the South because of things like that. That's our other connection to this. So you and then you. Uh -huh. so that's like, yeah, that's at a, at a lot of colleges, the black sororities and fraternities don't have houses on the campuses. Yeah, I, I went to school in California for grad school. Same thing. They didn't have black folks didn't have their houses on campus. Yep. OK, um, you and the yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, my dad grew up in Grange, Georgia. Um, he's an older. It's 59th birthday today, actually. And um, he had a run in with like a like a non suited clan member, and like so the clan tried to kill him, like tried to run him over with a truck, mm -hmm. and then after that was unsuccessful, opened up a case for him to like start criminal litigation against him for harassment and stalking. And you know there was no surveillance during that era. The only reason like he was able to escape that is because like we were connected to like. My uncle had loyal lawyer friends at Duke, but if it wouldn't have been for that, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. I was just gonna say very similar to um, how Tulsa County, yes, uh, the black families there were run out mm -hmm. because of threats of racism, threats of lynching, and there was no black people there for seventy years up until like mm -hmm. the mid to late nineties. Um, so, good. Is there anybody here that knows about Tantora in Palestine who can talk about it? <laughs> Wait, do y'all? It's up to you. Like, from the history of Tantora, I mean, they're, uh, they're pretty famous for, like, like, we don't have their actual name in the pattern of the Tantora that we have in the Black Wall Street, but, uh, yeah, they they do say that they were found at Tantora, but no one knows where they uh, were. But it's actually a documentary on And, and Tantora has, it's a mass grave. There's a mass grave of Palestinians and Israelis built a parking lot over it, over that grave so that they could get to the beach. Does that sound like anything that you know of in Georgia history? Who goes to Lake Lanier? <laughs> Nobody For the students who are not black, do you all know why people don't like, well, why we don't go to Lake Lanier? Why don't we go to Lake Lanier? <laughs> it's built on top of a, a formerly black state. This is where black people were driven out 
and it was flooded to make a lake for white people to enjoy. And underneath that lake are cemeteries where there are black folks buried. Do y'all see the connections with us? It's people doing the same things to us in different places. All right, so now we're gonna, and when I talked about like my last name, how, how our family has two last names is because our family had to flee and some people changed their last names because they were so scared of being chased. And I changed my name is back to our original family name, Hailey. So now we're moving up to this time period where you see there's even less of Palestine left. And this is what, how bold Israel is. Israel started a war with the surrounding Arab countries. Palestine didn't have an army, but during that war, Israel decides to invade Palestine and decides to split the capital city in half. That's its game. I'm gonna split this in half. Just let me get this. This is my negotiation. So they invade Jerusalem and take it in half and they say, West Jerusalem is now part of our country. Can y'all imagine if we went to Toronto and we're like, West Toronto now belongs to us. We redrew our borders and West Toronto is part of the United States. You all can have East Toronto, but we're gonna send our military there to watch you all every day and strip search you if we need to. That's wrong, right? Like that's crazy, right? You can't just redraw the borders of your country. That's what Israel did. It's actually a violation of international law. So that's how you get that border. Now we get to here and this is, we're really gonna be able to connect to this. So this, where you see even less, this is because of Israeli settlers. How many of y'all have heard of Israeli settlers? Did y'all know that they're not actually Israeli? They're from Brooklyn, they're from Florida, they're from the UK. They're people that show up and because they're Jewish, Israel gives them citizenship. And then they just show up on somebody's property and they're like, oh, this is mine now. They show up in literal caravans, like a mobile home, and they will just plot their mobile home on a Palestinian's land. And they're like, oh, this is mine now. Those people are settlers. So understand that don't think of them as like they have a right to the land. They came from somewhere else. They carry guns. Yep. But they don't need DNA testing. <laughs> Ask, you'll have to ask a Palestinian for more details. I've heard some things, but I'm not quite sure. So somebody else might know in, in depth. Um, we won't talk about that. We'll, we'll talk about something related to that. So Israeli settlers, this is what life is like with Israeli settlers. Um, how many of y'all heard about stories that black folks, like maybe your grandparents or great-grandparents age had to deal with night riders, Klansmen who would just show up at the house? That's what Israeli settlers do. They will just show up at the house with guns. They can come up in the house. They will stop your car and they can search your car. They're not police, they're not military. Remember, it's also not their, their country, it's still Palestine. And they can pull you out the car. What happens in this country, let's say you had to speak up because somebody's treating you badly because we'll give a, a real example. Let's say you're at the park bird watching and a white woman named Karen shows up and she lets her dog out on you to attack you and you call the police, what's gonna happen? Right, they're gonna think you did something wrong. They might not even ask anything. They might arrest you. That's what it's like for Palestinians. That's the same thing, okay? So this, this time period, um, 1948, where they wound up splitting the country in half and the Israelis came after them, that's called the Nakba, the catastrophe. You'll hear some Palestinians say the Nakba never ended, or they'll say what's happening right now is the, the second Nakba. The 1967, where they took over half of Jerusalem, the, that area, that time period was the Nexa, the setback, okay? Any, and then we talked about the legal settlements. Any questions so far? This is gonna prep you, because I promise you, you're gonna hear people tell you some messed up history to try and get you all split. One, how many of you all have heard this lie that Palestinians own slaves? I've heard it, not true, never. How many will, you might hear them say, well, Arabs own slaves. There was an Arab slave trade. That's not Palestinians. Even if there was, that doesn't justify genocide. But the goal is to get you to be like, oh, somebody did something bad to us like a long time ago. Let's let whatever happened to them happen to them. It's all manipulation. Any questions so far? Okay. All right. So you saw how spread apart Palestine is, right? The reason for that is to keep people separated so that they can't work together. And then once they're separated, there are different privileges given to them based on where they live. Easiest way to understand this is think about slavery in this country. Where did you work or where were you enslaved and had to do work if you were dark skinned? Say a ladder. Right, if you're dark skinned, you had to work in the fields. And in the fields, you had an overseer who was brutal, who could beat you, um, there was not, much access to food or water, you're out in the hot sun. 
If you had light skinned, where did you work? In the house. And you had more privileges. You didn't have to be out in the hot sun. You could still get sexually assaulted, beaten, but it's not an overseer with a whip. You have greater access to food, but you're still enslaved. You still are not with your family. You could still be sold off. You could still be beaten. But what was the point of separating Black folks like that? That's it. And why would they hate each other? That was the whole goal. One group has more privileges than the other. You all fight with each other about that instead of fighting the person that actually set it up this way. That's exactly what they do to Palestinians. Based on where you live, Israel gives you different privileges so that everybody could be mad at each other and going, how come you're going through this and I'm not, instead of being mad at the person that made that happen. So we're gonna start with what privileges are like in Gaza. And this, again, we're talking pre-October 7th. So in Gaza, there's hardly any freedom of movement. People in Gaza are trapped behind, is this the audio? Okay. People in Gaza are trapped behind a wall. They can't get out unless they get permission from Israel. Imagine if we had to ask Canada for permission to leave this country. Does that make any sense? And yet the world lets it happen. 97% um, of the drinking water was contaminated, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, whenever Israel attacks Gaza, they attack their water supply first. Why would you attack somebody's water? You need water to live. And if you don't live, we can get your land. Because remember, that's the whole goal is we want the land, but we don't want the people. That's, that's what the white team wants. Um, the unemployment rate there was 46%. There were several colleges in Gaza. People there are highly educated. But if you can't get outside of that wall, then you can't go look for jobs. If you can't look for jobs, what happens? You're broke, what happens if you're broke? Can't eat, can't pay bills, can't take care of medicine for your family, and then you die. Because that's the goal is either you die or conditions are so bad that you leave so we can get the land. So that's what it's like in Gaza. We move up to the West Bank. And let me actually go back to this so y'all can see exactly where it is. So the West Bank is this area that's along the Jordan River. That's why it's called that, It's on because it's on the West Bank of the river. So they can't leave in Gaza without permission from Israel. If they leave, they can usually leave to go into Egypt, the Rafa crossing. They usually can't leave and go into their own country though. They can't go into other parts of Palestine. In the West Bank though, they have more freedom of movement. So the West Bank is places like Bethlehem, um, Ramallah, Nablus um, Achilio, which you may have heard described as Hebron, and we'll talk about why that's not the right name. That's all of this area. They can travel through these areas, but every time you travel through this area, it's like going through TSA at the airport to get from one town to the next. Can you imagine going through TSA to get to Decatur and the city of Atlanta and in Dunwoody? Think about how many hours you have to show up at the airport ahead of time, but also, you have to pass through Israeli settlements where those, those folks who act like the Klan are out there with guns and they can stop your car. Then when you get to a checkpoint that's like TSA, if you've got your family with you, they got to get out the car. You can drive through, but your family has to get out. And then they got to stand in line. And on one side of the line is a wall. The other side is barbed wire. That's sky high. Do you want your family going through that? And then you can be strip searched and it doesn't matter your race. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter your age or your gender. That's what you got to go through to get to the next town. If you had to live like that every day, would you want to? The Palestinians are steadfast, so they still go through it, but they don't necessarily want their kids to go through that. It's like, I might be tough, but I don't want my kids to have to suffer. And that's the goal is to try and put pressure on the kids so that the whole family leaves so they can get the land. But that's the privilege they have of not living in Gaza. They have more freedom of movement that they can go through all these towns, but it's still really rough. So even to get to work, you might have to leave three hours early to get to work every day. It's extremely difficult. Uh, in terms of water, they have greater access to water. But remember, there's still Israelis living here illegally. When you go through the West Bank, you can look at somebody's house and tell if they're Palestinian or Israeli because the Palestinian homes have water tanks at the top because the Israelis only allow them to get water two to three times a week. So they have, exactly. So they have to keep that water stored because they don't know when they're going to get it again. Israelis might be across the street and they can have swimming pools. Racism, that's pure and simple. When we talk about the contaminated water in Gaza, who does that sound like in this country? Flint. Do you know people in Gaza were advocating for Flint? Because they understand this connection. They understand it completely. All right, another thing, um, so I'll talk about when I was in the West Bank, I went to Achilil. You might hear of it called Hebron. Um, there's a documentary about Hebron, a short called um, something, it's, it's about, just look up Hebron, and Dina Takori is her name. 
Um, it's like it used to be my, my hometown. When you go there, they have Jewish only streets that Palestinians can't walk on. Does that sound familiar? Like what? Like colored only water fountains, colored only bathrooms, which you knew were gonna be inferior because they designed it to be inferior. So when I went there, I was actually walking down the street with our tour guide who is Palestinian. And he had to stop the tour because the next street over, he's not allowed to walk on, even though it's his country. But coming down that Jewish only street was an American who was a tour guide. What is an American doing being a tour guide in Palestine? That's not his country, but he's an Israeli. Because he's Jewish, he was given Israeli citizenship. So he's walking down the street that he has the privilege of walking down. He comes down to the street where we are because he's allowed on that street too. And he turns to our Palestinian tour guide and he's like, oh, I love this guy. He's one of my best friends. What does that sound like? Some of my best friends are black. I can't be racist. And that's what, it's the same thing. You've got all this privilege that you have not earned that this Palestinian man doesn't have in his own country. And you think it's okay because you're nice to him because you smiled at him. It's okay that you still benefit from racism. Same thing's happening. Um, another place I went to in the West. Oh, so let me actually tell you about um, Al-Khalil. So you'll hear Israelis refer to it as Hebron. Reason for that is there is a lie that they tell that they say, we showed up on this land and there were no people there. Do you think people really showed up someplace in 1948 and there were no people there? But there's people in all the other surrounding countries? No. So then you ask, well, what about the Palestinians who were there? And they don't call them Palestinians, they call them Arabs. Who knows why they would call them Arabs instead of Palestinians? They actually say there's no such thing as Palestinians. Why would they say that? Mm -hmm. To discredit like, them having an indigenous identity. That's it. That's it. Because if you just say they're Arabs, then you can say, what is it, one of the things we are, how many people have heard, go back to where you come from, go back to Africa. Been here now since I was five, go back to where you come from. Same thing, so if they just say that they're Arabs and not Palestinian, then we can say, well, why don't they just go back to an Arab country? It doesn't matter which one, as long as it's not, they're not in Israel or not in Palestine. That's the goal. That's exactly it, to discredit it. And to make it seem like they don't have a history. Anybody else know that? Where like, we get treated like our history started at slavery like we weren't in Africa first and stolen from our land and taken from our language and our culture. Same thing, let's pretend they don't exist. Huh? Yeah. It actually is standing too, like when you consider it, it's in Abraham, and Abraham um, was like in, in all three of their Abrahamic religions, he's like a friend of God, and a friend means to like, to be friends with or like your friend. Thank you. Lydia needs to be a minister, but she, she won't accept that calling, but she should. So the reason, one of the things that they try to do to make us think that there is no history of Palestinians there is they change the names of the cities and erase the Arabic name and give it a Hebrew name. So that's why you'll hear Hebron is Al Khalil. Correct people if you hear them say it wrong too. Um, another town that I was at in the West Bank was Birzeit. Birzeit University is there. How many of y'all have heard of Birzeit University? It's like Harvard like brilliant minds, she's like, I know, <laughs> brilliant minds out of that school. When I was there, they were having their student council elections. Tell me, what's it like on your campus when there's student council elections? Flyers everywhere, what else? Social media posts. So at Beers 8, the people running for office had to wear a ski mask. That's because they are such brilliant leaders and activists that they are considered a threat by the Israeli government. So after they announce the winners of the student council election, the Israeli government tries to find out who won the student government election so they can arrest them. So when I was there, we couldn't take pictures. So I, I want you to remember that when you see people in ski masks and we're supposed to go, these are terrorists. No, they're concealing their identity, but think about why they're concealing their identity. Because they're going to be arrested and possibly tortured just because they decided to run for student government. So I want you to think about that the next time you see somebody's face covered, why is their face covered instead of the reason that we're told. So we couldn't take pictures of any of them. And right after we left is when they announced the student council winners and the Israeli occupation forces showed up to their school, their campus in tanks and arrested them. We're gonna come back and talk about that in a second. Um, if you will, oh, so another thing that happened when I was at Beer Zay, I met with um, the head of this program called Right to Education. They actually do virtual talks to students and faculty about what it's like trying to go to school under occupation. If that's something you all want to, ever want to talk with them about, like they're, they always want to talk with people. Um, and back before this genocide, they actually used to travel to different colleges in Georgia and other places to talk about what it was like. So I met with the program director 
And she said when she was a student that they told her in school, if we wanna learn how to get free, Palestinians have to learn what African-Americans did. Because it's a big deal for us to come out of 400 years of enslavement to where we are now, right? So I asked her like, what books have you read? I said, have you read Autobiography of Malcolm X? And she said, no, the occupation doesn't let us buy books written by black people. Who does that sound like? <laughs> it sounds like what's happening now. It also sounds like our past where enslaved black folks were not allowed to read or teach each other to read. And why weren't we supposed to know how to read? You can know things, that's the same thing. Yeah. When I was watching Origin, the movie, that um, Nazi Germany patterned the Holocaust after what was being done to Africans yes. in the United States. Like they patterned it after Jim Crow. Like they set up the Holocaust around Jim Crow. Absolutely. They don't want people to know all of this information. So it's not just that they don't want Palestinians to get ideas about how to get free. They want them to feel alone. Who knows any Black folks that support Palestine? Any, any writers, anybody who's written books? Or anybody? Yeah, just, uh-huh. Yes, Asha Monet. Yep. Who else? Angela Davis. Anyone else? What? Nelson Mandela. Yep. Desmond Tutu. Yep. Anyone else? Alice Walker, the woman who wrote The Color Purple. She's advocated so hard for Palestine, she wound up actually suffering a stroke because she was like, I'm not giving up. James Baldwin. Yes. Right. Anyone else? Mark Lamont Hill. Y'all know him. George Jackson, 100%. Yes, the Black Panther Party. It's quite a lot of us. So it's not only that they don't want Palestinians to get ideas about how to get free, they don't want them to know that they're not alone. That's why what you see right now is so important. This is actually the opposite of everything the occupation wants to happen. Palestinians are not alone in this room right now. All right, any questions about that so far? Okay. All right, um, so we talked about how they have more freedom of movement, but still challenges. When you move up to East Jerusalem, so let me show you where East Jerusalem is. It's kind of adjacent to the West Bank. It's like here. There's an apartheid wall that keeps it separate from the rest of the West Bank though. But remember, as you move up on that tier, you have more privileges. So Palestinians in East Jerusalem have the freedom to travel throughout the West Bank and they can travel throughout Israel. I'm calling it Israel because that's what we're used to hearing. It ain't Israel. What Palestinians will call it sometimes is 48, as in the year 1948 when it was taken from them or heartland Palestine. Heartland Palestine meaning this is still Palestine. Nobody asked us permission to take it. And they also don't wanna call it after the year that it was like of their pain. You know, for us, for so many black folks, we remember like the pain of what we've been through. This is a way to reclaim that and say like, we're not, we're not just naming stuff after our pain. So people in East Jerusalem have freedom of movement, but if Israel has West Jerusalem, you know they want East Jerusalem because it's adjacent. Think about when you're in this country, how can you tell that you're in a good neighborhood, good neighborhood or white neighborhood, and then you're crossing into a black neighborhood? Graffiti, what else? Infrastructure. The infrastructure changes everything. Train tracks. When you go to West Jerusalem, which is Israel, and you cross into East Jerusalem, you cross over train tracks. I was like, oh, I know where I am. When I was there, the shuttle driver, how many of y'all, I don't know, know if y'all remember this, like how many of y'all have ever had problems before Ubers with taxi drivers that wouldn't pick you up because you're black? That's before your time. <laughs> that was my time, sorry y'all. Okay, so that's what it was like when I was growing up um, is that taxi drivers wouldn't pick up black people. So the driver who picked us up from the airport, we told him where we're going, we're going to East Jerusalem. There's train tracks, he pulls up right to the train tracks and our hotel is literally across the street, we can look at it he won't cross the train tracks. He says, you gotta get out and walk. I was like, I'm home. I know what, exactly what this is. Exactly. Um, so in East Jerusalem, because you know that they already have West Jerusalem, so they want East Jerusalem. So the way they try to do that is through home demolitions. So let's say you get married and your family has all this land, especially if those of us from the South, we know what it's like when our family has land. How many of y'all are from the South and you got family that has land? It's a big deal for us, right? because of how hard it was for black folks to hang on to it, because we would get taxed and everything else as excuses to try and steal our land. It happened to my family where they were able to obtain land after slavery, and then people kept coming and saying, you got to pay more taxes, and then piece by piece, they took it, so most of our family land is gone. Same things that happened to the Palestinians. So in East Jerusalem, like let's say you get married, and your family already has land, so you want to build an extra wing onto your home and just live there with your extended family. 
you have to ask permission from another country. You got to ask Israel if you can build a wing onto your home. And if you're Palestinian, 94% of the time, they will say you can't. Because remember, they're in the, the whole goal is to make life difficult, so you're out of there. So what a lot of Palestinians will do is they'll build an extra wing onto their home anyway. It's their land. If they do that, Israel's military court will require them to destroy their entire house. Y'all know what that would mean. Think about, especially for Black folks, what it means to be homeowners. Because so many of us, did, our families did not own homes. And even like during, like after World War II, white families would be given grants to be able to buy homes and our families weren't. So when we finally get a home, it's a big deal. So imagine with all that they've gone through, with how much land that they've lost, and they've got their own home, and Israel orders them to destroy their home themselves. Can you imagine tearing down your home? We just talked about your mama ain't playing that, right? Does that sound like something Palestinians would do? Yeah. Because our people have, have suffered so many similar things because it's the same tools are being used against us to try and diminish us and make us lose our power and, and land. So what happens is if you're ordered to tear down your house and you refuse, then Israel will send the military to your house with a bulldozer, usually from the company Caterpillar, and they will tear down your home, but they will also send soldiers there to watch your home get torn down. And then they send you a bill to pay for the soldiers and that bulldozer. Right. And then where do you live after that? after they tear down your home. Maybe you leave the country, which is what they want, or you'll move into a refugee camp. A refugee camp is like living in the projects. What are the projects like? Run down, right? There's not enough food, right? Because you, where do you get food from? The land. So you're off your land and it's cramped conditions. It's not a big house. You're living in, like they, there's a limited amount of space. So they go sky high. They're not like spread out. There's not a lot of room for your kids to run and play. The food deserts is right. It's hard to access food. And what about the police? What do they do in the projects? Over policing. You know the police are going to show up in the projects. Same thing happens at refugee camps in the West Bank. Janine refugee camp. Israeli military is always showing up, and they come and they actually bomb their area. Like they only tell us about Gaza and barely, but actually they're bombing in the West Bank as well. And especially they go after that refugee camp in Janine. All right, so then now we're gonna move up to the next tier, um, not East Jerusalem, but um, next tier up is Palestinians who live in Heartland Palestine. So remember, they're, they're everywhere, just like you got black folks in Buckhead. Think of it that way. Um, where some people will be like, there's no black people in Buckhead. And we're like, yeah, we're there too, we're everywhere. Same thing, there's Palestinians here too. But because they're in this area, they were given Israeli citizenship. As a result, sometimes you will hear Israelis call them Israeli Arabs. Because remember, they're still trying to pretend they're not Palestinian. These are Palestinians with Israeli citizenship. They have more freedom of movement. They have access to, they can travel throughout Heartland Palestine, throughout East Jerusalem, throughout the West Bank. They have water, but they still have it rough. So Israeli settlers who live in Heartland Palestine walk around with guns. So there's a, a woman that I know is Palestinian who has Israeli citizenship. She is a researcher. She works on cancer research. When she goes to work, the settler next to her has a gun and he has permission to shoot her if he thinks she's a threat. Do you think he thinks Palestinians are a threat? Of course, because they're a threat to what he wants, which is to get them off the land. What happens if you go to work with somebody that has a gun and they have the right to shoot you? What would you do? You probably stop going to work, right? What happens if you stop going to work? No money, if you have no money, then what? You, you can't live there. No, not, no, but like for real, like you don't, Except, this, but keep in mind, I'm actually telling, wait, as we're laughing, remember I'm telling you about somebody who's real. This isn't something we're making up. This is like, I'm telling you literally about somebody's real life right now. A young woman who just wanted to study how to like help people not have cancer. And she can't go to work every day because there's somebody there that wants to kill her. It's not real funny. Remember what it's like too, to be in a room where we're educating white people about our culture and they tell a joke. Is it really funny? No, you got to remember this is real people we're talking about. Even though it's like tense and that helps break the tension, it's like it's still, this is somebody's real life. Okay, and then at the top of the pyramid, the people who have all the privilege are Jewish Israelis. Something you need to remember is these are not all white people. There are Ethiopians who came over from Ethiopia and because they're Jewish, they were given citizenship. They get treated like trash. 
but they still side with the occupation. Um, when I say occupation, what I mean is military occupation. It's like military taking control of the land because I used to hear that and wasn't sure what it meant. So there are also Arab Jews. So they can have, Israelis can be from Yemen. They can be from Morocco. They can be from Iran. They can be from Ethiopia, Russia, the US, wherever. Israel just wanted more Jewish people because they wanted to have more Jewish people than Arabs. They brought in Ethiopian Jews, but they didn't want too many black ones. That's not a surprise, right? That you can laugh at, because that is funny. That they're like, I mean, that like how racist they are. It's like, we want you, but not too many of y'all. So what they did was when Ethiopian Jews were coming in, oh, God. That's exactly where I'm going, yes. So they told the Ethiopian Jewish women that um, you all are deprived of vitamin D. Black, black folks in this country are vitamin D deficient. So they told the Ethiopian Jews, you all are deficient in vitamin D. We're going to give you a vitamin D shot. What they actually gave them was Depo-Provera, birth control drug, because they didn't want too many black children over there. And they didn't tell the Ethiopians. They didn't realize it until nobody's having kids. And they're like, how come there's no children? And it's because there was forced sterilization. Has that happened to black folks in this country? Yes. Forced sterilization? Yes. Um, I forgot what they used to call it. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer, a civil rights activist, was forcefully sterilized. You all know about that? I think they called it like a Mississippi appendectomy or, or something like that, like a cute name that they make for, we don't want too many black folks. We want just enough to work and like do the hard labor. And after that, we have no use for you. Unfortunately, when I was there, what I saw was that the Ethiopian Jews in the occupation forces were the most violent. Everybody talked about it. Why do you think the black ones would be the most violent ones? towards Palestinians? Yes. That's it. That's it. It's like, I know y'all are racist, but if I'm racist towards these Palestinians, will you all accept me? And does it work? Do you think they're accepted? No, no. They still get beaten. They had their own Black Lives Matter march. And it's like, these people don't care about you. When I was there, there's Afro-Palestinians. So I want to talk about where Afro-Palestinians come from. A lot of them are Muslims that came there as part of a pilgrimage, like they were going to Hajj in Saudi Arabia, and then they stopped in Palestine to go to Al-Aqsa Mosque, and they stayed to resist the occupation. So that's, because you're I promise you're going to hear this lie one day that they're enslaved people. They're, that part of that history is not the same as ours. They are Afro-Palestinians. And when I went there, our guide said, I'm calling them Afro-Palestinians so you all understand who they are. To us, these are Palestinians. They're like, these are our people. Um, and the Afro-Palestinians would not talk to the Ethiopian Jews. They didn't look at them as like, oh, we, we're all, we have black skin. It was like, no, y'all are oppressors. Okay. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, y'all. All right, one of the questions. How many of you all heard after October 7th, how come they're so violent? How come Palestinians never choose peace? How many of y'all heard trash like that? Okay. Have you all heard that about black people before? Yes. What kind of things have you ever heard about us? We're aggressive. What else? We're angry. Exactly. How come you guys always burn stuff down? Have you heard that? Do you like my voice? Let me. That's the voice that I hear it in. <laughs> anyway, that's what I heard all 2020. How come you guys burn stuff down? Like, how come you, like, I don't understand. And I'm like, why do you do nothing? So let's talk about all the forms of nonviolent resistance prior to October 7th. Hassan Kenafani was an author. An author, he was killed in a car bombing by Israel, him and his niece. The Great March of Return is when Palestinians in Gaza walked to like a peaceful protest, a march to say in the siege on Gaza, they were met with tanks and sniper fire. Imagine enslaved people having a peaceful protest to say stop slavery. Do you think it's going to work? They're, all the enslaved people are marching saying set us free, let's do it. It's not going to work, right? Yes. Great march. What's here? Thank you. And then have you all heard of Shireen Ablakle? U.S. citizen. She's Palestinian and a U.S. citizen journalist, and she was killed by Israeli snipers. Our country's supposed to care if people from the U.S. are killed, right? So, but these are all, the, all she did was she reported on what was happening to her people. And for that, these people were killed. That's it. Do we know anybody else who's been killed for telling the truth who's black? Brother Malcolm, exactly. <laughs> All right. Sorry, y'all, I keep 
I haven't been in the classroom in a while. Okay, so now that you've heard all these horrible things, why would our government still support Israel? Yes. But, and you you actually will know more about that than I do. That's what like it's important for y'all to talk to each other. I know some stuff about politics. Y'all are gonna know some things that I don't know. So you gotta talk with each other. So APAC, how many of y'all have heard of APAC? Okay, right. So APAC, political action committee. So think about when it's election season and you see TV ads for candidates. It costs a ton of money to get a TV ad on. Um, when you see like billboards and you get those flyers in the mail, you get those text messages, all of those things cost money. If we donate to political campaigns, usually I will not give more than like 100 and I gotta think you're great to give that much. That $100 isn't gonna get somebody on TV. They need a huge amount of money. And that's where groups like APAC come in, the American Israeli PAC, Political Action Committee. They will give money to candidates as long as that candidate supports Israel. It does not matter if you're a Democrat, Republican or independent, as long as you support Israel, they will give you money to fund your campaign. So it's not going in your pocket, it's to pay for all the stuff that we have to see before elections. So that is why you see politicians doing what they say because they want that money to stay in office. Questions so far? Yes. Um, interesting. So they get the money, a lot of it from this country, from, from people in this country. And the assumption usually is that as Jewish people, it's actually a lot of Christians that give money, Christian Zionists. You know those people who read the Bible and say Israel, like if you bless Israel, you will be blessed. And then they forget the whole part where Jesus is like, um, don't kill people. Like, like they just completely ignore that part. Those people who actually don't even like Jewish people who think they're going to hell will actually give money to pro-Israel groups. It's Christians. They're the majority of the people giving money. Yes. Right. So they, they think Jewish people are going to hell, but then they still will give money to support Israel, thinking that it'll mean they'll all go there and get killed. It's racist. So that is why our politicians are supportive. So there's actually a deal where one of the presidents of the United States signed a memorandum of understanding to give Israel $3.8 billion every year for 10 years. So a total of $38 billion with the caveat that that money can only be spent on its military. Do you know which president that was? Barack Obama. I know, right? We're like, we, it's a lust for our team. I know, sorry, y'all. It's okay, we, oh wait, I'm supposed to be, I'm, I'm nonpartisan. All right, okay. So anyway, but here's what's interesting. Do you know when he campaigned, Palestinians campaigned for him? Palestinians raised money for him because he was from Chicago where there's a ton of Palestinians. He understood what was happening there. So why would he do that if he understood what was happening? Because there is elections coming up and it's here's money for people who are running. So not necessarily him, but other people that are running. That's my thought. That Everything else I told y'all is fact. That part is my guess or analysis. So when you see somebody who's on the streets who does not have a place to live, think about what your money could be doing with that. Because that's, that's actually our money. Each of us, like when you pay taxes, how many of y'all work and pay taxes? That's what you bought. That's what you bought. So you can actually look up, like if you Google US military calculator, Israel, something like that, it's on US CPR's website. It'll tell you, like you can type in your city and your state and it'll show how much money is leaving your city to go to Israel's weapons and how many public houses you could buy with that, um, how many public school teachers you could find all of those. Exactly. Exactly. I have my mom is a professor and was teaching about the NECPA and got called in about it and had to provide material to prove that the NECPA happened and that there's discrimination against Palestinians. Um, all right, so now we're going to get to October 7th. Oh, yes. Like international blowback is used for people of like the crisis or like you know the 
I understand exactly what you're saying. So let's see what capacity am I in here today? There's different places where I can be more honest than most. Once I take this off, I can go outside and be real honest. I want y'all to go back and read all the comments you heard at the debates from both sides with the context of what you know now. And with the context of what do you want people to do for, for your people? If black folks were experiencing a genocide, what would you want people to say? And what allowances would you give to them for not telling the truth? That's gonna make you think a little differently about different people. Um, I understand you're talking about like the, the repercussions. Are you talking about international repercussions or? Right, so what Israel tends to tell people is that they have to be there because of Iran and that there's a nuclear threat. What do most people, most people in the world want peace. They actually want to be left alone. When people tend to build up weapons, it's because they're afraid they're not gonna be left alone. What you see happening with the surrounding Arab countries like Saudi Arabia, that's like normalizing relations. They like that government just wants to have business deals and make money, that's it. It's usually what you'll see is people want peace. The governments are trying to figure out how to make money or they're thinking there's a threat. They, I, in my opinion, there would not be a serious threat. I think there would actually be a significant decreased threat if Israel had less weapons. Because think about, if you think about all the conflicts that are happening in that region, who's starting them? Us or Israel? Israel with our weapons or us with our weapons? So if you get rid of, if you make that stop, then like, what do people have to fight over? People will still probably find a reason to fight, but not to this degree. And they won't have the capacity to fight to this degree. Yes. I think the like countries like, you know, like Ireland and like other places like recognizing Palestine as like a state. And do you think that like that could potentially be like a further like drive for other European states and other like countries even to start recognizing Palestine or what that would do in the near future? Or do you think that's kind of no, so what do you all think about, like, when you see somebody, how many of you all just started, like, paying attention to what's happening in Palestine, like, within the past year, like, October? Okay. And what was it? Does anybody remember what the thing was that made you start paying attention and having the courage to show up? Was there any one or two things that did it? Okay. And, right, so that some people doing something made you do something, right? That's for all of us. When we see other people doing something, that helps us find the courage. Like for me, well, I, well, it was two people. It was Mario and Barguti. I actually get to that in a second. Um, and, for, and I don't know if y'all can remember this because y'all gonna make me feel old. 2014, Ferguson, Missouri. Mike Brown, we're actually gonna skip ahead. Mike Brown was an unarmed black man who was shot by police. There were protests in the streets, not just a protest, it was an uprising. There was tear gas that was used on the protesters. Do you know Palestinians showed up there? Um, Sandra Tamimi, she has, I think, um, Adala Justice Project, I think is the name of her organization. She was there. There were other Palestinians that showed up. Linda Sarsour was there. Linda Sarsour, when you hear her talk, you're like, oh, that's our people. Like, she, you can tell she's been around Black folks a, a lot, but also like really cares about Black folks. They showed up because they were like, oh, this, we recognize this. This is what happens to Palestinians. The thing that woke me up, I wasn't there, I was in California at the time, and I'm looking on Twitter, seeing my people getting attacked by police for days. And I see Palestinians in Palestine tweeting instructions on how to deal with the tear gas. And that hit my heart so hard. It's like, you don't know us, but you care that much about us. That one thing was it for me. I was like, all right, where else can I get information? And then the next is, is a lot of little sparks for me. Um, then there's a brother, um, I always talk about him, Ahmed Abu Zneid, a good friend, who is Palestinian, who's a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. Ahmed took black leaders over, like civil rights activists, over to Palestine. And he actually started his work as an activist advocating for black folks after Trayvon Martin was killed. 
I'm like, here's another person that doesn't know me, cares about our people. And that just opened my heart wide open. It's other people doing the right thing makes other folks do the right thing. So yes, when Ireland takes that stance of saying, we recognize you as a state, we acknowledge your existence. Because remember the goal is to pretend Palestinians don't exist. Just that is enough for other people to start going, oh, we know what the right thing to do is too. Let's start pushing towards that way. So it's, it can be one small act can start moving people. Ask the money. U US government, um, the UK, and a lot of it is countries where they actually don't like Jewish people and don't want them here, want, don't want them here. So it's like, oh, you all will stay over there. Here's money for you to stay there. 100%. Mm -hmm. Racism against them and Palestinians. But you know, just like how we talked about like house slaves versus field slaves, like there's some people who are like, I know you hate us, but if there's benefits to it for us, we'll take it. And we'll just treat these people worse. You're like disgusted right now. <laughs> You're like, I see it. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Our country likes to be like, don't talk about money. It's like, no, it's money. Um, it's also the lie that they tell us because it's, and this is the worst thing I've heard. They're like, Israel is like people surrounded by, like in the middle of a really bad neighborhood. And what they're really saying is like, they see them as white and they're surrounded by brown people. Remember all these Israelis are not white, but also all these brown people ain't dangerous. Is here's a group that we can, that will do what we say sometimes and has weapons in case we want to use them about, against brown people. That's really against Muslims. That's the truth of it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And real quick, so the, how many of y'all have heard of the potato famine? So it wasn't even a famine, it was that the British were stealing their food and then rebranded it as a famine. Yes. Right. Yes. And I want you to understand, like some people will, you'll hear some folks who realize what's going on is wrong and they don't want to completely admit it. And they'll be like, it's the regime, it's Netanyahu's regime. And it's actually like, this has been going on since 1948, actually before. So keep that in mind and pay attention when you see that language because it's people who are like scared to go all the way with saying the truth. Um, do we want to take a quick break for food? Yes. All right, I'm going to get started because I want us to be able to talk too. All right, are y'all ready? She said, are y'all ready? <laughs> all right, so we're gonna, this is towards the end of it because I want us to get to discussion. So all these horrible things that Israel has been doing and we didn't really, really understand it until after October 7th. How have they been disguising this all this time? This is, some of this is going to apply directly to you all, especially in AACP, we're gonna get to that. Ooh, that's okay because y'all are being rebels by being here today. So pink washing, how many of y'all have heard of pink washing? That's when Israel does stuff like having LGBTQ film festivals and they invite people like Billy Porter. 
Yo, do y'all know who Billy Porter is? Who was on polls? Who gets on my very last nerve? Um, he does. I thought he was great on polls. In real life, he's a problem. But they have film festivals where they invite LGBTQ celebrities and then they go, look, like all the bad things you heard about us aren't true because look at, like we have gay people here and we celebrate them and they don't do that in Gaza. And so it's supposed to justify everything that they do to Palestinians in Gaza. Do you know that there are gay people in Gaza? Okay. Even though there's, there's homophobia in every country, it's not justification for oppressing people or killing them, but it's supposed to set up a stereotype for us to be like, oh, look at how modern Israel is. They don't let gay people get married. All the stuff that they try to pretend Palestinians are like is, what's the phrase? Every um, accusation is a confession. When you hear Israel say that somebody else is doing something, they're actually telling on themselves. Like, see, like almost every time. Um, greenwashing. How many of y'all have heard of that? Yes. Exactly. Thank you. So greenwashing is where I'm, like, I'm going to give an example of it. So there is a place in Palestine called Deir Yassin, and there was a massacre there. And so Israel killed the Palestinians in Deir Yassin, but then also destroyed their homes, dug up the homes, even the trees, everything. We talk about ecocide. Then they wanted to cover up that there had ever been Palestinians there, because remember, that's part of the goal is to erase the history that there were ever the indigenous people there. So what they did is they started planting trees to hide the fact that this was ever a village. But you could tell that the trees were planted and it wasn't just like a forest growing naturally because they were all planted in straight rows. That's that greenwashing where they're like, it's a nature preserve. No, this was actually a Palestinian village where you destroyed the people. Yep. Yes. Yep. So yeah, the trees, so... You might hear some people talk about how when they were children that they went around collecting um, money for the Jewish National Fund. Have you ever heard anybody talk about that? Who, who says that? I can't say it. Do y'all know who said it? Okay, somebody that ran for office. Okay. Um, there are people who will sometimes run for office and talk about how they collected money for Jewish National Fund. Jewish National Fund is where, like when I was a kid, they had it where people would knock on doors and just like have like cans and ask for dimes. And then send that, what, what did you say, Renee? Say it louder. Thank you. Okay. Um, these are just, we're sharing facts because we, we're just sharing facts here. So Jewish National Fund would have people go door to door and raise money. And those, that money would be used to buy trees that would get planted in Israel with, into heartland Palestine. Those trees are not native to that land. And so they would catch on fire and set the land on fire. It's basically the land is rejecting them. Like, you're not, like, this is not yours. You don't belong here. This is what we got to really pay attention to, blackwashing. This is what was done in South Africa during apartheid, is where you all know about what happened in South Africa, how black folks were oppressed there. The South African government would pay for black folks from the U.S. to come over to South Africa, treat them really well, so that they would come back here and be like, I was treated really well. I don't know about apartheid. I never saw any of that. They do that to y'all. Um, an example of blackwashing is, so I went to Spelman College, Morehouse College, Student Government Association, when they had elections, APAC got in touch with the NAACP in Georgia and asked to be put in touch with the student council office at Morehouse College and asked Bakari Sellers, who was the SGA president, if he wanted to go on a free trip to Washington, D.C., and on that free trip to Washington, D.C., they told him if you ever, they introduced him to all these funders from APAC and said, if you ever want to run for office, we will help you get the money for it. So think about what they do to the student council president and vice president over at Beers 8 University. They put them in jail where they can be tortured. Over here, they come to different colleges, specifically HBCUs, and they look for young black leaders and they take them on free trips to D.C. and sometimes to Israel. They're trying to destroy the young Palestinian leaders and they know how much we all have in common. So they're trying to groom black folks to be separated from Palestinians at a young age so that when you're old enough to run for office, you're so focused on, oh, there's money for me if I run for office. Let me disown my Palestinian siblings. That's why what you all are doing here today, not just as black folks, but as NAACP in solidarity with the MSA is very important. Yeah, it is, I'm for real.
you all are going against the plan to keep us separated. Remember that because at some point you might hear higher up, like NAACP is speaking up now about an arms embargo and saying stop arming Israel. That's really bold for, I mean, we know it's the right thing, but that's still really bold because there's always money tied to it. Groups like APAC, pro-Israel groups will dangle money. And, and there's, there's a reason for it. It's not just, it's because black folks have a history of speaking up for what's right. And it's like, how do we keep y'all silent? And how do we keep y'all silent specifically on Palestine? What about the Anti-Defamation League? They actually put together a program for the police in this country to go and train with Israel's police. So that's what's happening to Palestinians will happen to us. It's already happening to our communities. And then that same group, the ADL that sets that up, they work with the NAACP. That's where y'all come in, where the Palestinian students and the MSA might not be able to get into these spaces, NAACP can. And y'all can talk to your elders about this work. And y'all can talk to your classmates about this work. And not just at Georgia Tech, but at other schools, when APAC and those other groups show up and they're like, dangling stuff in front of you because let me tell you how disrespectful it is it's not that they're just trying to separate you all from palestinians they think we can be bought by a trip that's how low they think of black folks and they purposely will go to people who have not traveled much and who are from small towns to say oh you've never left your town you've never been outside of mississippi you want to go to washington dc i had a friend at grambling state where they try and, and to approach her to take her on a free trip I know another black man at FAMU, they tried to get him on a free trip and he just got lucky to meet a Palestinian who explained to him what was really going on. So tell your friends, nothing's free. Everybody wants something from you. What I want from you is for you to speak up. And I'm saying that to just be very candid because candid, somebody wants something from you at all times. So if you see somebody who's talking about a free trip and supporting Israel and all that, they want something. Your job is to figure out what it is that they want and don't think that you can like just take the free trip and there's nothing else that comes with it. No, they're, they're buying your silence on what's happening to Palestine. But remember, it's not just that they're trying to separate us, it's actually an insult to us that they think we're so cheap. So not only do you need to watch out for APAC, there's a group called Philos Black. How many of y'all have heard of Philos Black? It's actually run by a white right-wing conservative and he hires all black people to be the faces of it. And Philo's Black will come and ask people, Black folks, to come on trips to Israel. They're not doing that as much right now because there's a genocide. And they know nobody's trying to come during that time period. But they recruit Black folks. They go into churches. And they call it a birthright trip, which is crazy. So uh -huh. is it your birthright to go into somebody else's native land? No. And they used to do, they do birthright trips for Jewish people, but now they're calling black Christian groups are having birthright trips. So how many of y'all are in a church or members of a church? I left my church. My church stopped speaking up about Palestine. My minister used to speak up about Palestine. And for me, my deadline was Christmas. If you can talk about the day Jesus was born and can't talk about what's happening to his people in his homeland, I'm done. But I didn't just leave. I sent a message to the deacon to say, you all know that this is wrong too. I'm leaving, I'm speaking up, you need to say something too. These are the types of things you all can do is use your power in these spaces where Palestinians can't go. There are black folks in different political positions that are abusive towards Palestinians. A lot of Palestinians won't say something about it because they're still being respectful of us. This is our lane. Like when I first got into this, I was like, what's my lane? I'm not Palestinian, what am I supposed to do? I wanna help, but I don't wanna step on their toes. What I can do is call out the hypocrisy among black folks and also warn other black folks when there are people that are trying to use us to turn on our Palestinian siblings. So there's, you gotta think about what it is that you have, the power that you have, and it's not something you gotta go get, it's already inside of you. There's a sister I was talking to who's Pakistani. Where'd you go? There you are. Pakistanis have a similar history to Palestinians. Just telling your story is enough to make an impact, to bring us all together. How many of you all did not realize how much we have in, in common? You're not gonna be able to forget it. And that's what the goal of people that support Israel want is for you to not understand that. Um, and then the last thing, Islamophobia, we gotta talk about, how many of y'all heard that horrible lie about 40 babies being beheaded on October 7th? Unfortunately, lots of people believe that right away. And it's because they just believe the stereotype that Muslims are walking around with swords. Look at your Muslim siblings in this room. Ain't nobody walking around with a sword. 
they used to tell that kind of lie about black folks. And they would say, like in the 60s, they would say black people walked around with razor blades all the time. Did y'all ever hear that? It's the same kind of lies and it's to justify whatever evil is being done. Okay, any questions about that? Let's see. So when I first got into this, I was like, I'm black. I want to help, but I don't want to get in this movement. And then people tell me there's not a place for me because that would just break my heart. This is what guided me. Hassan kind of funny. He's telling us we actually have an obligation to be a part of it. He's inviting us and then saying, here's your invitation. But if you're not a part of this, we're going to die. So we have a moral obligation. That was enough for me where I'm like, I'm in. My heart was already into this, but you're telling me I get to be a part of this. I'm in. That's it. So we talked a little bit about this already, solidarity. How many of y'all know people in 2020 who talked about being allies? I don't trust nobody that says they're an ally. How many of you all, should, and you all might've had a different experience. How many of you all had people say that they were allies and they turned out to not be allies? Who wants to tell a story? <laughs> Do you wanna share your story? Okay, anyone have a story to tell? Are y'all just being quiet? I'll quit being quiet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just thought I, I didn't participate because I knew it was part of like, uh, you know, just long ago. So I'm just like, I've not counted, but I've just noticed that like, I'm, I'm involved in the activism about like a lot of things. And so anytime I post a video, it was only because that time that they had something that that black square that's like impact. Yep. Like, obviously there's in the life and it's like it's something like disgusting and racist and like it's like yeah thank you yes you do have a story yeah. <laughs> this is more so like general a bit more this is like a bit more general but just like looking at the different like History Month or Awareness Month and like how companies will like try to change up so that they can like be more, you know, like during Pride Month they'll have their like rainbow months and whatever, but it's like but it's like then the rest of the year they're just like quiet. Exactly. Yeah. Those are some of the that that concern people like Black History Month to say Pink History Month is better as like just to have like just just to capitalize and help to have a they're trying to like capitalize off of like your identity. Yep. I'm losing people. All right, I'm gonna hurry up. So solidarity is basically I'm in this fight with you. Allies is like, I'm so sorry it's happening to you guys. Allies is I'm in this with you. So when we you will never if you hear somebody talk about black and Palestinians and they say allies, watch out. Because that means they're not actually working on this stuff. Solidarity means like I'm I'm whatever you're going through, I'm gonna be there with you to the end. And it's not, I feel sorry for you. It's actually because you'll hear this phrase repeatedly, we get free together. When Palestine is free, we get free. Part of that is I thought we were free. And then I realized that I was scared to say Palestine. I was like, if I'm that scared to say Palestine, I'm not really free. And then I said it and I felt free and I was like, I want more freedom. And then I started going to protests and the police were out there and I was scared. And I was like, why am I scared? I'm scared because these people are brutal but this is my right. I shouldn't be afraid of that. I'm out here for Palestine. Palestine's getting me free. So that's what that solidarity is about. We get free together. So a couple of quick examples. Y'all know about Cop City that they're trying to build here in Atlanta. Israeli forces are already training our police. They would just keep coming back here to do it. And it's based off of Little Gaza. So you already know about that. When you go in East Jerusalem, there's security cameras everywhere. Atlanta is currently the most surveilled city in the United States. Our politicians, not just in Atlanta, but other countries, go on free trips to Israel, and Israel shows them their surveillance technology so that they can bring it back here. Who are they going to use it on? Us. <laughs> Georgia State Patrol, the folks that, if you have friends at Emory that were hurt at that encampment, that's who got trained. Um, and then skunk spray. Skunk spray is... Or it's a chemical weapon that was used on Palestinians and it smells so bad, it's described as, sound, as smelling like a decaying donkey. It's the, and people vomit to the point of dehydration and needing hospitalization. After the protests in Ferguson where black folks were protesting, 
Israel flew the police department that killed Mike Brown. They flew him to Israel and gave um, the police department an award and then sold them skunk spray. So it's the same thing being used on Palestinians. They sold them, who's it going to be used on? That's, that's what it's for, for us if we advocate for our rights. So that's what it means to get free together. Um, and this is the sister I was telling you all about, Marian Barghouti, who spoke up when we were getting, when Black folks were getting tear gassed in Ferguson. I had the honor of actually running into her in Palestine, literally just walking and heard her voice. And I was like, hold up, are you Mariam? And she's like, yeah. And I said, you're what got me here, like seeing what you did speaking up for Black people. And she said, everything I learned about solidarity, I learned from Black people in the US. And she's like, so this is just a circle. You're part of that circle. So you all are actually, by being in this room right now, this is part of our legacy for both Palestinians and Black folks and Muslims, we can't, like all of this, this is our history of what we've done. So you're part of that. All right, um, and then this is where we can get into the discussion, how to be in solidarity. It's not just being like, oh, I can relate to you all. It's like actually taking action. So, and there's different ways to take action. Calling your elected officials is annoying, but it actually makes an impact if you do it consistently. Kind of like Dancing with the Stars or American Idol. So you call every week to make sure your favorite person comes back. That's how you got to do it. If you call every day, they keep track of how many people call every day. Protests let people know that, like in Gaza, that we're not giving up. We're still here for them. Boycotts are easy. If somebody just gives you a list of places and says, don't spend your money there, that's an easy thing to do. You can go home and tell your families about that. Um, and then following these voices. So if you don't know what to say, there's already people saying it for you. You can share it on social media. That's it, y'all. Okay. <laughs>